OK, so there's only one step left, the key step, the powering step, which has this parameter t. And this is the part that increases the badness in a, a three-coloring instance. OK, well, it transforms to a different kind of CSP. So the main effect of this powering step is to take a three CSP with a certain amount of badness and increase its badness by a factor of t. Well, so you get a factor of t divided by some universal constant. And the side effect, well, it will blow up the size by a constant to the order t. It will also give you this like, kind of complicated CSP with a gigantic, albeit constant size, label set, and still complicated binary constraints. So let's see how this goes, and then we'll be done with everything. So here's the idea. You take this 3CSP G, which has made, been made an expander, and that's crucial for powering. And the output CSP G prime is going to actually have the same vertex set. It's just going to have like many more edges. And as I mentioned, the powering operation is kind of like teeth powering the adjacency matrix. So the edges, aka constraints, in the new CSP G prime will correspond basically to length t walks or length t paths in the input graph g. You can basically think of g, by the way, as a three coloring instance. It actually has some equality constraints in addition to the non-equality constraints, but basically like three coloring. Uh, and will I even do like the lazy version of walks where you can also do a self loop? And so for every vertex in g and g prime, uh, although it had degree 17 in g, it's going to have a degree which is something like something like 18 to the t in g prime because it's going to have like a constraint for every walk of length up to uh, t and there'll be like you know 18 choices at each step because it's a 17 regular graph and you can also do a sub self loop and the new do new domain is going to look like sort of strings over the symbols red green and blue of length like roughly 18 to the t like the number of these possible paths So that's why the domain size is just like three to the 18 to the T. Okay, so that's the story in the size and the domain. And like, basically now I wanna tell you what the constraints are and why they achieve this main effect. And that's gonna be everything. Okay, so G prime, same vertex set as G, but like the, edges slash constraints in G prime are going to correspond to these like length T walks in the original graph. And the domain is going to be like these really long strings of like red, green, blue. And I should also say that like, I'm now going to start to get quite hazy on a certain point. These paths, I said they're length T, but they're really like length around T. And try not to stress out too much about like, what does it exactly mean like around T? It's like a bit of a, Point where you have to do some like tricks, which I don't want to get into, but just let them be like hazily, not length exactly t, but in the neighborhood of t. Okay, so what is the meaning of this new domain size? So in the G prime CSP, you have some, like some vertex, let's call it U prime, and think of a label for U prime. Uh, don't think of a string so much. Just think of like U prime's label is supposed to represent an opinion, a quote unquote opinion, on what um, U's, I guess U and U are probably the same here. I'm not sure I, I use different letters. On what U's um, neighbors at distance at most T should be labeled in the old graph. Okay, so a label in G prime for U consists of like a bunch of labels of each label being red, green, blue for like U's distance T neighborhood in the original graph. Let me try to draw a picture. So let's say this is like a piece of the original graph G. And uh, let's say T is three for extreme simplicity. So here's a, a path of length three in the graph G. And so this will become like an edge in G prime. Okay, and what's, I haven't said what the constraints are yet, but I'm talking about the labels now. So the point is that like the labelings, instead of labeling the vertices by red, green, and blue, you're now gonna label them by like, these very complicated looking things. Like a label for A in omega prime is like an assignment of red, green, or blue to all of A's neighbors at distance at most three. So it might look like A should be red, B should be green, C should be green, D should be green, E should be red, F should be blue, G should be blue. And you know, probably there's like more 
edges out here as well, but I just drew a piece of it. Okay, and in the CSP G prime, G will also supposed to be, this vertex here will also supposed to get like labels that look like a red, green, blue assignment for all of the distance at most T neighbors of G. Okay, and I call these opinions, and we'll use that terminology because that's how you think of them. Okay, so this is what the new graph is. It's got these like length t paths as its new edges. This is what the new label set is. It's like these big opinion sets. What are the constraints? Well, the constraints are actually the most natural thing. So like this AG is now an edge in G prime. We're supposed to put a constraint on it about how these two kind of labels from omega prime should be given. And what you basically do is check all the things. I mean, check everything that would be logical to check. So the constraint checks a lot of things. First of all, it like, you know, A and G have some vertices that are at, potentially have some vertices at distance, you know, at most T from each of them. So there's some vertices, like let's say F, that are like opined about by both A and G, little g. Should have used little g as the key vertex, but anyway. So for example, A's opinion on F is that it should be blue. Little g's opinion on F is that it should be a green. And this is contradictory. So um, this assignment, this example assignment would falsify or like would violate this constraint because it would fail this check. Uh, but that's not all. The constraint between A and G in this new uh, CSP does some more. For each um, edge UV in the original graph, like let's say EF, which is within distance t of both a and g, if like a is close enough to e that it has an opinion on it, and g is close enough to f that it has an opinion on it, then you check that a's opinion about e and g's opinion about f satisfy this ef edge back in g, which is either a non-equality constraint or an equality constraint. So this is the definition of like these uh, constraints. Actually, you really only need these ones. You don't actually need these ones, but you may as well put them in. Okay, so it remains to show that, I've now defined for you G prime, and it remains to show that this powering step works, that like the badness in G prime is bigger than the badness in G by a factor of T. And I wrote like omega of T to denote like T divided by a universal constant. And again, provided the badness is smaller than an absolute constant. And I switched to putting show in quotes here because like I've glossed over enough stuff now that I'm really just sketching, not showing. And so the argument is actually kind of similar to the argument we saw for degree reduce. You take an assignment A prime for G prime, and you say that like, well, I can get from an assignment A for G. That assignment A for G has to be violating a badness fraction of edges. And I'll deduce that A prime is satisfying like T times badness fraction of edges in, in G prime. So I have like a couple more slides sketching this and then we'll be totally done. So this is what we got to show. And here's the start of the proof, but don't panic. Uh, so let A prime be the best assignment for G prime. And so A prime is like for every vertex W, A prime consists of like a bunch of opinions for like the red, green, and blue for the neighbors of W or the distance T neighbors of W. So let's write A prime of W sub V for W's opinion for V's color. So that's just red, green, or blue. And now we're going to define an assignment A for the original free coloring type instance G. A of a vertex is, to figure out what A's value for a vertex is, you basically look at all the paths of length about T starting at V, going to some vert different vertices W. And each of these vertices W has an assignment A prime. And since they're a distance T, like this A prime of W has an opinion about what V should be. So like all of these like distance t or more or less neighbors have like an opinion about what quote unquote opinion coming from a prime about what red, green, or blue value it should get. And you take the plurality opinion. Okay, so that gives an assignment a for g. Now like a little bit of bookkeeping. Um, t is this distance parameter. Let epsilon zero be one over t. And let epsilon denote, basically denote the badness of g. 
whatever that happens to be. Except that if epsilon is, if badness is already bigger than epsilon zero, then instead let epsilon denote epsilon zero. This is a minor point. Okay, so we know by definition of badness that A, this construction A that we got, violates at least a badness fraction of edges back in G. And in particular, uh, that badness is bigger than epsilon, so it violates at least an epsilon fraction of constraints back in G. So just pick out any fraction, a set of exactly epsilon fraction of edges from G that are violated by A. You know, it's going to be at least epsilon, so just fix some set of fractional size epsilon and call that set F. So this is a set of edges back in G violated by A. And it's an epsilon fraction of edges. And finally, like before, like for each of these edges, we want to kind of show that it induces like kind of like T time, T mm, bad path constraints in G prime. So this is our final goal here, which we'll do on, I think, the last slide. So this is our definition of the assignment for A, and we have this fixed set of uh, epsilon fraction of edges back in G that are violated by A. Now, consider the following sort of thought experiment. Pick a random edge from G that's in this violated set F. I don't know, think of F as standing for fail. Okay, this edge is also in, in G prime. And now form a random path of length around T by doing like a walk of length around t from u, and let's say it ends at a, and also a random walk from v of length around t, let's say it ends at b. Now, this walk, this random path itself will have length like about 2t, but like, please gloss over this fact. Please like, don't worry about the fact that like, well, this path is length t, this path is length t, but I'm also gonna try to claim that this whole path is length t. They're all around t, like, don't, don't worry about that part too much. So, um, this is like kind of a thought experiment. For every edge u, v, and f, imagine sort of extending it to like a length around t path in g prime. Now, this is also the procedure that's used to define a. You see, to get a's assignment to, well, let's look at v. To get us a's assignment to v, by definition, we kind of take a, all the paths or like a random path from v of length around t, end somewhere, let's say B, and then look back at B's opinion on what V should get, red, green, or blue. So sort of by definition of this plurality assignment, when you like kind of take a random path of length around T starting from B, you get somewhere uh, B and you look back what A prime of B says you should assign to V. By definition of plurality, like there's at least a one third chance that that opinion will be the plurality vote. So what I'm, I'm saying here is there's like a one third chance in this thought experiment, that A prime of B's opinion about uh, V will be the same as the plurality, A of V. And similarly for you. And when that happens, and this happens with a one ninth chance over this choice of random two paths or this random path from A to B, A prime violates the A B constraints that exists in G prime. So we have this constraint, it's a path of length around T, so we have a constraint between A and B in G prime. And one thing that is checking um, is that the assignment A prime, uh, that it, the assignment A prime to A, that its opinion on U and A prime's assignment to B's opinion about V have the property that they satisfy this edge. But if they agree with the assignment A, and uv is an edge that a violates, then a prime is violating this a to b path constraint. And that happens for like one ninth of all these paths. So thus, and I put this in quotes because I'm really getting a bit sketchy here, but this is exactly how the proof goes with a little bit of care. The overall badness, the fraction of path constraints um, violated by this best assignment a prime for g prime is at least one ninth the fraction of length t or length t or so paths in the graph that pass through this set f of epsilon fraction of constraints violated by a. And this looks pretty good. All we need to show is that this is um, at least you know, t times epsilon. 
And it kind of feels good because, um, you know, you have these paths of length t that have around t edges on them. And intuitively, uh, an epsilon fraction of all the edges are these like, you know, violated edges uh, from f, which is, and so like, you know, you get a violation in g prime by a prime, whenever one of these random paths like passes through like this set f. And if t edges, these paths, and an epsilon fraction of the edges are bad, so you kind of expect t times epsilon chance of a bad uh, path in g prime. I'll say that in more detail at the bottom, but the only thing that could go wrong here is that, you know, this set of violated edges f, they could be all like cornered up in like one piece of the graph, and maybe most paths in G evade this set of violated edges F. But this cannot happen finally because it's an expander graph, which was the whole point of expanderizing. So the picture here, the high level picture is you have these edges in F, they constitute an epsilon fraction of G. These are the yellow edges. And like you pick a random path of length of about T. And now since you made G an expander, the edges in this random path kind of look like they're distributed uniformly. Like this is the key property of expander graphs and like spectral bounds. And if you do like a random walk, like pretty quickly you get to the stationary distribution. And like a typical edge that you traverse looks just like a random edge in the graph. Okay, so you need the expander mixing lemma to actually formalize this. But the point is, you know, if you just now, because it's an expander, you can sort of pretend that each edge in this random length T path is like a uniformly random edge. And therefore, it has an epsilon chance of passing through one of these violations, f. And so the probability of a random path, which is like a random constraint in g prime, missing f completely is like 1 minus epsilon to the power of t, which, you know, by original uh, lecture 2 or whatever about approximations, we know 1 minus epsilon to the t is basically the same as 1 minus t times epsilon. Well, provided, you know, uh, epsilon is smaller than 1 over t, but it is by this setup. So this says that the probability a random path misses f is like 1 minus t epsilon, so the probability a random path hits f is like t epsilon, and like a, we know that like if you hit a random edge, you sort of have like a 1 9, oh, sorry, if you, a random path hits f, it has like a 1 ninth chance that its endpoints are violated um, get assignments that violate the constraint that you put on this path. Okay, so you get this divided by one ninth, and uh, that completes the proof sketch. So, uh, sorry for going uh, quite a bit over time, but I'm done. This completes the proof sketch of the PCP theorem. It also completes the course, so that's the end. That's our last lecture of CS Theory Toolkit. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for sticking through it. It was quite, a memorable semester. Usually like, you know, in the last semester or the last lecture of like a course, I like to, you know, bring in like donuts or like croissants or whatever, but I cannot do that because you're all at home in a lockdown. So uh, the next time I see you, it's, it's on me. So next time I see you in the fall or whenever, remind me of this and we'll go down to Tatsa and get like a chocolate croissant or something. And we can reminisce about uh, CS Theory Toolkit. Okay, so uh, as always, I will stop there, and uh, but I'll stick around to answer any questions you might have.